This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association for jobs, the economy, and public health committed to advancing health and economic opportunity for all Virginians. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. This week in Richmond, and welcome three members of the House of Delegates, all representing portions of the great northern part of Virginia. Delegates Richard or Rip Sullivan, Jennifer Williams. Carol Foy, Marcus Simon, uh, two of you from the class of 2014, that must seem like a long time ago, and one <laughs> of the new 19 from the class of 2018. So, delighted to have the three of you here to talk some about this issue, this session, the issues that you've been working on, the issues that are of concern to you. And Rip, why don't we start with you and just come right down the road to, if each of you would mention one to start with, and then let's talk, let's have you talk together. Well, it's been an interesting session so far, David. Uh, from my perspective, I've been telling people that uh, uh, everything's different, but nothing has changed. Um, as uh, I think you know, there's a, a dramatically different makeup of the House of Delegates this year. Uh, our surge to 49 uh, uh, has, 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 in fact, uh, changed the look of the floor. Um, we needed those last two votes to, to, to change control, of course. Um, uh, so in that sense, nothing's changed uh, in terms of committee chairs and speakerships and things like that. But things are very different, um, and we've begun to see sort of the power of our 49, uh, which has been, uh, from our perspective, uh, very encouraging to see. I've been involved in everything from um, election law issues. Uh, I've always been involved in um, environmental uh, and uh, renewable energy issues. And we've made, and I think we're going to make some real progress uh, on that environmental front this year. So I'm excited about that. Thank you. Our new member. Yes. yes. Um, so for me, uh, one of my platform issues was criminal justice reform, uh, being the first public defender elected to the General Assembly, uh, making our criminal justice system more fair and efficient um, was paramount to me. And so one of the things I'm excited about is hopefully getting the grand larceny threshold increased from $200, where it's one of the lowest in the country, uh, to hopefully $500. And so that's real progress. I've spoke to many legislators who've been here way longer than I have, and they've told me about the struggle of getting it done, and it's been proposed for almost over, for decades at this point. So that's something that's really exciting. And um, for me, as a freshman, I put in about 20 bills, and I am happy that I have about four that has been carried over to the Senate. So uh, two in education, which I'm really excited about, one foster care bill, and one dealing with search warrants, because I used to be a magistrate also. So it's really exciting, all the dialogue, and to see what changes have been made when you vote so many Democrats in office. The conversations have changed, um, which is really exciting. Thank you. Marcus? Yeah, I would actually, um, I started out feeling the same way as Rip, that, that nothing really had changed much. And I'd say at the beginning of the session, I think Republicans were really sort of quick to reassert their control and say, we're still in charge here. And we saw that in the way that the committees were composed and where some bills got sent. But as the sessions unfolded, you know, we've started to see some cracks in that. We've actually started to see uh, what, what it really means to have the power of 49 and have that many seats. And, and I think the biggest change uh, has been in our budget. And uh, it looks like we're gonna, in the House version, we're going to get uh, Medicaid expansion in the budget for the first time. Uh, we also saw a, a crossover, a number of bills 
that got out of committee, which had been stacked for Republicans, but by the time they got to the floor, they realized that those bills couldn't pass on the floor and they got sent back to committee sort of mysteriously at the end. Um, so we were able to kill some things without taking a vote. So I think that the way things play out and the way things work, you know, everything starts out at the subcommittee level and, and percolate up, but by the time they get to the floor where we, where we truly have that near, near parity, uh, we're starting to see um, some evidence of, of what our change in makeup has, has meant. Um, again, I'm most excited about the idea that we're going to get a budget out of the House. I'm fairly confident on Thursday uh, that's going to have uh, Medicaid expansion and health care coverage for 300,000 Virginians that haven't had it previously. You know, I didn't plan it that way, but it was interesting as I was checking your backgrounds with the somewhat declining number of attorneys or people <laughs> with law degrees that all three of you, two mm. practicing attorney, one a public defender, but all with, with law degrees. Um, how is it being uh, in the minority of, of attorneys serving in the General Assembly? You know, when I'm, when I'm in front of uh, a group of attorneys, I love to talk about how we need more lawyers in the General Assembly. Uh, but that line doesn't usually play well in front of, in front of a more <laughs> well, general crowd. Right. I, I actually, uh, I think it's great that we have fewer attorneys only because uh, what I think is, makes our General Assembly so strong is that we're a citizen legislature. And uh, the fact that we have doctors and farmers and teachers and a few lawyers, uh, I think, gives us uh, sort of a leg up on some other legislatures which are filled with, with end up being professional politicians. And the first public defender. Yes. I hadn't checked back through history, but that, that's interesting. I, won, I, wonder, I wonder why, but we're welcome. We're glad to have a public defender. Thank you. In, Thank in you. Legislature. Yeah, I think it's um, important. We've had, we have a lot of prosecutors at the table um, when we're talking about courts and a lot of the legislation that's going through. Um, and that's something that I was very serious about is combating a lot of the tough on crime uh, policies and bills that were coming up because Virginia has one of the lowest crime rates in the country. And so having more tough on crime legislation at this point just doesn't make sense when you have the federal government and other states rolling back a lot of their three strike laws and enhancing misdemeanors to, to felonies and, um, and mandatory minimums. And so I saw a lot of that legislation try to come through this year. And as a public defender, I was able to lend my voice and say how counterproductive that is. It's not efficient. It doesn't make sense to the community. It harms families. It has disparate impacts on minorities and people who are poor. And so I know that some of that legislation did not get through this year. And so that's what's imperative and important to have different voices that come to the table. And as a public defender, I can bring that. Our caucus meetings have gotten even more interesting because we've got prosecutor Mike Mullen and we've got public defender <laughs> Jennifer right. Carroll Foy, and it's, it's watching a great it. courtroom <laughs> argument. It's a lot of fun. Yes. You know, I would uh, I agree with Rip and Jennifer. It's great to have some diversity amongst the lawyers. Not all lawyers are the same, and we all practice different parts, areas of the law. We have criminal attorneys, commercial attorneys. I do real estate law. Um, and I, 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 sort of, I like what Rip said. I like the fact that we don't have so many, but it does kind of amplify our voice and our influence on committees and things. People will often you have the ideas, but we, we legislate words, and so it, people do turn to the lawyers sometimes on the subcommittees and committees to say, well, how do we do this? And it gives you a little bit of extra, uh, I think, gravitas when it comes to influencing you know, and shaping some of that legislation. Um, so having the variety of, of backgrounds is good, but also having a variety of different kinds of attorneys. And again, being you know, one of a few that actually practice, I mean, we have lots of folks with law degrees, but fewer of us that actually practice law on a regular basis. Um, I think it makes us a little more influential as, I don't tell my other colleagues I said that, but um, <laughs> it does help us, I think, it helps us out on the floor, it helps us in committee, it helps us do our jobs better. How, how have you seen, and I'll start with you, Marcus, as far as urban, rural, regional, as I said, you all three represent portions of, of Northern Virginia, does that pull you together, or pitch you against other, other regions, or how, how you, have you seen that working out for several now sessions since 2014? Well, you know, there's definitely, um, I mean, there's the urban crescent that we talk about. In a lot of ways, we try and work together with folks in Richmond and the Richmond suburbs down through Hampton Roads with Northern Virginia, and we have a lot of issues that are in common. But Northern Virginia is sort of an entity unto itself, and people say it almost uh, disparagingly when they say it. Oh, uh, you're from Northern Virginia. Um, and so there is some, some rivalry there, it's particularly when it comes to budget time and resources and allocation of resources. Uh, you know, one of the big issues this year is you know, funding Metro, and making sure Virginia funds its share of Metro. And there's a debate that goes on about how that should be done. There's some folks that think we in Northern Virginia are just tax ourselves for it. Uh, those of us from Northern Virginia feel like Metro is an engine for the whole state. And we send you know, so much economic development that we generate in Northern Virginia benefits the whole state as a whole. 
everybody ought to pitch in uh, to pay for Metro. So, yeah, and they pick on us sometimes too. Every now and then, you know, particularly Arlington for whatever reason, uh, seems to get picked on by, by some of the folks. The other thing is it used to be more of a regional divide. I, I, what, we've done some self-sorting. Uh, so it used to be we had regional divisions and party divisions. In a lot of ways, our regional divisions now kind of reflect our partisan divisions. Um, you know, we've got Chris Hurst and Sam Rasool out in Southwest, but for the most part, you know, Democrats tend to cluster in those urban areas too. So what used to be you know, regional or partisan divides have kind of sorted themselves out into being both in some ways. Did you, did you have a comment? Um, yeah, so I would just add to that that um, one of the things I know, I, I was born and raised in Petersburg, so I can relate to a lot of the issues that Southwest Virginia has when you talk about underfunding education um, that I understand intimately, whereas in Northern Virginia, one of our top issues is not only Medicaid expansion, but also transportation, whereas a lot of Southwest Virginia don't have that issue. So it's about empathizing what's happening across the state and not just in your area, but I think everyone are, it's, it's what's important to everyone are, are those kitchen table issues, transportation, education, Medicaid expansion, so. Mm -hmm. David, there's something really interesting going on in the General Assembly this year. Um, Marcus mentioned uh, Metro, I'm carrying the Metro bill. And part of the argument is, as, as, as Marcus suggested, that what's good for Metro, what's good for Northern Virginia is good for the rest of the state because we're that economic engine. Um, but there's a really interesting bill uh, working its way through the General Assembly that would make dramatic changes to development issues in Southwest, Southside, and the Eastern Shore carried by Will Moorefield. Um, and what I've said in support of that bill is we make the argument all the time about what's good for Northern Virginia is good for the rest of the state. Well, it's true the other way as well. What's good for the rest of the state is also good for Northern Virginia um, because if we're struggling down there, and we are, um, that's bad for everyone in the Commonwealth. There's a wonderful book I would recommend to your, to your readers by August Walmeyer called uh, The Extremes of Virginia, and it paints in stark tones um, uh, the difficulties that, that those three areas are facing compared to the rest of Virginia. So um, that bill's moving through. Uh, no one knows yet what's going to happen, but it's a fascinating uh, effort, and a lot of Northern Virginians have joined in the effort to pass that bill which could give a real shot in the arm to economic development in Southwest, Southside, and the Eastern Shore. And, so, and the other chamber, Senator Stanley, has a bill that's somewhat of a companion bill, mm -hmm. has some differences that you'll be considering in, in the House. And I think that it, it is remarkable in the years I've been around Capitol Square to see that, that effort being made to help the areas of the Commonwealth that are the extremes. Sure. Well, that, some of that has that, to do with our new governor. Um, you know, comes from the Eastern Shore and I think has a, uh, obviously a special place in his heart for um, parts of Virginia that have been left behind a little bit. Uh, I will tell the viewers that we're having the conversation after crossover, but by the time they're seeing the show, they may, some of these things may be working out or they may be going on, on over to the reconvene day for the final action that will take place, whether it's on, on Metro or whether it's on the extremes of Virginia or some other issues that waiting to see what the governor uh, does and what the governor may send back to you all on the, on the reconvene day, which uh, certainly could be a most interesting day. Always interesting, Always but is. it could be a bit more than usual yeah. this, this time around, certainly could. Uh, before time would slip by, what are some other issues, and Jennifer, why don't I start with you, some other issues, not your bills, but some other issues that you've really gotten an interest in by seeing the ones that have been introduced by colleagues or, or bills introduced that you really cause some heartburn that you have difficulty with? Um, some of the ones that I'm really interested in was the at-risk funding for schools. I believe that was a patron by Moorefield and I believe chief co-patron by Lasheris Aird, um, who represents Petersburg. And that's something I was really excited about, to see so much emphasis placed on underfunding of schools. Um, in Virginia, we have a serious teacher shortage, and to see it being directly addressed this session is, is overwhelmingly uh, great. So I know that's something I was really uh, excited about seeing. Um, something was heartening, but I think they put a pulse on what was happening and they pulled it was the uh, guns on, on church property this year. So to see it go as far as it did um, was a little concerning, but luckily it didn't come up to a floor vote. Um, so I know that, that that's still that conversation going. A lot of the bills, uh, almost all the bills that came up for gun safety and gun reform were, were killed, such as bump stocks and a number of other 
things to directly address a lot of the school shootings and um, mental uh, ill people being able to so easily obtain uh, weapons. So um, that was really disappointing, but I'm really optimistic about the changes that's happening in 2019. So I mentioned earlier uh, my interest in renewables and energy efficiency, and there is a, a bill, I think it's one of the, it's, it, one of the most important and certainly one of the more controversial bills that we're dealing with this session, euphemistically called the Dominion Bill, uh, has to do, uh, it's a reaction to the rate freeze bill of a few years ago. Um, and I've been sort of up to my eyeballs in, in working that, negotiating that. Uh, and as we sit here today, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but uh, frankly, I'm encouraged by the progress uh, of that bill in terms of improving its terms. And from my perspective, um, uh, particularly the energy efficiency piece of it. You know, when I first got, I've been screaming about energy efficiency since I got here um, uh, to no avail. And when I, when I first got here, people sort of teased me about it. Um, but we're finally getting traction on that, on that issue. And I, I think there's some transformational language in that bill that, that could really take Virginia um, uh, where it's never been on energy efficiency. I'm really encouraged about it. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Excellent. Marcus? So I've... I think the two big issues that have dominated the session uh, have been the progress we've made on renewable energy through this rate freeze bill, and I think that's going to be exciting, with the, whatever comes out of that. Uh, and I've actually had to take a crash course on it because, you know, although it's not been my area of expertise, my constituents care a lot about it, and they sort of, when I go back to do town halls, they want to know what's going on. So I've, I've gotten immersed in that, too. I've been very disappointed, like Jennifer, in the, the tone on, on gun violence prevention and gun reforms hasn't changed at, at all. Uh, even with 49 members here, and that's been disappointing, particularly given what's been going on in the news while we're down here. Um, so those are the two main issues that, that have been a, a source of concern. I've been a little bit uh, encouraged about um, the, the tone on um, elect, election, well, I would say encouraged. We, we've, um, we've had some discussions about election reform and things like that, and some of the easy stuff we've been able to address, but re redistricting reform, uh, is something where we're starting to actually see a little bit of progress uh, for a change. Um, it's been something that nobody wanted to talk about for a while, and those bills kept dying in committee. Uh, but starting to see some uh, agreement on both sides of the aisle that we ought to have some criteria that are more objective, take some of the politics out of, of gerrymandering. I think some of that's just a, a, um, a result of the fact that Republicans may realize they may not be in complete control of the process come the census, and so all of a sudden they're all about bipartisanship. Uh, but I think that's encouraging for folks, and so um, I think that's one of, the, one of the surprises, one of the little bits of good news uh, that's come out of the session. I, let me just add, jump on what Marcus was saying. I, I agree with him that we're starting to see some movement there. I think some of it has to do with recorded votes and videotaped hearings. That's right. The um, transparency is you know, Things may still happen at 7 in the morning, but we've got video records of what happened and, and now recorded votes even in subcommittee, and that, that changes the dynamic, there's no question. And I'd just like to add briefly on yes. the environment issue, uh, coal ash. And so um, seeing all the gains that we're making for environmental issues, so not only is in the renewable uh, area as far as with the rate freeze bill, but also coal ash. We have come farther trying to deal with the coal ash issue this year than we ever have before. And that is um, th thanks to some of the work that State Senator Scott Serval and others have done laying that foundation but there's actually a study group that's gonna be formed so we can move forward with this. And although Dominion has been helpful, there's been some hesitation with some things, but to actually deal with that, that's so impactful uh, for a lot of constituents who well waters have been um, poisoned. I mean, that's really imperative. It's really important because we get one time to do it and do it right. Thank you, each one of you for being on this week in Richmond and for the information you've shared. I thank you very much. Thanks, thank for Thanks David, it's been great to be here. Delightful to welcome two additional members of the class of 2018, 19 of you. Glad to have the two of you on, Elizabeth Guzman, Lee Carter, both representing a portion of Prince William and Manassas, Manassas Park, and then that portion of the Commonwealth. Really wanting you to tell our viewers about your experiences during this session, not quite over, um, and what, what issues are important to you that you've been working on? Elizabeth, we'll start with you, then with Lee, and then let's let's go with the issues. Uh, well, with the issues first? Yes. Okay, so for me it was, as a mother of four children, public education was really important oh. for me. So I had quite a few bills that were relevant to public education. I had some 
related to special education and also high school counselors because the Code of Virginia states that the ratio should be one counselor to 350. However, in our neck of the woods where we represent in Prince William County, right now we have one counselor to 450. And the reality is that we're losing the opportunity to help these children with a college application, to provide them with a vocational survey, and we are losing the opportunity to diagnose if they have any mental health issue. Right. And counselors don't just treat the person, they treat, them, they treat the environment. So it's imp there's no way that they can help, one could help 450 students. Right. And special education as well, you know, in our, in Prince William County, we are facing overcrowding in schools. And in most of our elementary schools, we have one classroom for special education children. So I wanted to just reduce the ratio, but then I realized in the process that actually we haven't done a study in a few years. So next year I'm coming back to do a study on the special education field as a whole in the public education system. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Lee. Yeah, and I had uh, quite a wide variety of, of bills that I uh, brought forward this year. So I brought three that were related to workers' comp. Um, you know, I was actually motivated to run for office because of a workplace injury and because of the ways the workers' comp system failed. So uh, that was sort of near and dear to my heart. Uh, but I also had uh, a bill to make sure that you can choose who repairs your cell phone when it breaks. Um, I had a net neutrality bill. Uh, I had a bill to deal with coal ash uh, because, you know, up in Prince William County, we've got the Possum Point um, coal ash facility up there. So um, I, I brought bills on, on quite a wide variety of issues. Uh, all of which are, you know, either near and dear to my heart or are I important in my area. Yes. And what about your impressions then of the session? Uh, this this is your first. So what, uh, Elizabeth Lee? Which? Uh, I could say that it's hard to describe. You know, one thing I know it's like it was like drinking water from a fire hose. So that we had no time for emotions and feelings. We were like robots, right? We have to do this, what is next? And then it was a learning process at the same time. So we can, our first month we've been working for 14 to 16 hours every day. And it's just been challenging. But the good thing is that I challenge myself also to present a lot of bills. And it had good things and bad things. The good things are that I'm coming back with the same issues next year, and I already know who sits in all of those committees, and I know what I need to work on. Uh, the bad thing is that I was not able to pass so many because I was a freshman, and I challenged myself. I worked really, really hard. You will not be able to see me in my office if you wanted to talk to me. And it's not because I didn't want to meet with anyone, yeah. but I was going around lobbying for my bill. But I think it was a good experience. You know, it's a lot of, uh, I believe that all of the things that we are fighting for are bipartisan issues, issues that are relevant to all hardworking Virginians. Yeah, um, you know, for me, I think it was kind of exactly what I expected, uh, but I ran a campaign based on how broken Richmond is, so I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, there, it's certainly uh, a little busier than I expected it to be, uh, you know, as far as um, making sure that you got time to read all the bills. Uh, you know, reading all the bills is sort of a revolutionary thing around here. There's not a lot of people to do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, you got to make time to, to actually uh, read all the bills, be informed about what's in them, make good decisions. Uh, you know, sometimes a, a little tiny enactment clause at the end of a bill changes the entire purpose of it. So uh, you got to be able to actually dive deep in, in all of these and make informed decisions, which is, uh, you know, not always done around here. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, going forward into the next session, uh, you know, I'm going to have to make more time to sell my bills to others. Uh, but, you know, for the remainder of this session, the biggest focus is on making good decisions uh, on the bills that are brought before me. So as you as you move on through this and this session ends and you move on into reconvened and, and on beyond that, um, what would be an issue that, that you see that you really would want to work on for even the upcoming session? Lee, Elizabeth? Uh, well, you know, obviously working on our workers' comp system is, 
is very near and dear to my heart. Like I said, uh, three out of my 12 bills were dealing with workers' right. comp this year. Uh, we didn't see any progress there, although uh, the the chairman of the subcommittee that, that heard the bills did agree that uh, the sections of the code that I was trying to work on uh, are probably in need of some updating. So uh, we've got some work to do uh, through you know the summer and the fall to make sure that uh, we've got language that uh, is more agreeable to everybody involved. Uh, so we can't update those sections of the workers' comp code. So that's going to be my biggest priority going forward. And, and Elizabeth, and I see that we're really running out of time, but I think you mentioned the ones that you're passionate about that you'll be continuing to work with. Appreciate the opportunity just to get you introduced to our viewers and look forward to having you back on for a longer show on This Week in Richmond. Thank you very much. I know. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for the opportunity. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you 